35 minutes into the second hour of Tracks Momentum. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, it's now time for us to have our special interview feature. It's titled Budget 2024 Analysis. And uh, yeah, this is an exclusive space for us to have an in-depth conversation. And today we're going to dive into the heart of fiscal matters with a special focus on the uh, recently tabled Budget 2024. And joining me in this uh, dialogue are actually two very exceptional guests that I actually had on air here in the studios last Friday. Uh, first up, in the studios, I have Professor Dr. Baron bin Abdul Hamid, the economic analyst at the International Center for Education in Islamic Finance. Professor, welcome to the studios. Most welcome. Thank you. It's an honor for me to, break, to be back in the studio as well. Likewise. Mm. And also on the phone lines, I have the founder and CEO at the Center for Research, Advisory and Technology. In short, it's called CREATE. And uh, she is none other than Ng Yen Sen. Hi, Yen Sen. Good morning. Hi. Good morning, Anil. Good morning, Professor and everyone. Hi. Sorry, I couldn't make it to the studio and the video is not working. So oh. I'm doing this. Uh, oh. Like I'm calling everybody else over the phone. <laughs> okay. And, and, you know, to your defense, you have a very crisp and clear voice. So, you know, that's okay. We don't have video. That's fine. You do justice <laughs> with you. your beautiful voice. Thank you. Yen Sen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank All you right. for having me again. You're welcome. Uh, so lots has been discussed over the weekend after the budget was actually tabled. Um, let's focus on the good. But before we, you know, shine the spotlight and talk about, you know, fiscal amounts and the millions or the billions of dollars allocated for many things, one thing that actually caught my attention, this one was on TikTok, was um, a post about a prime minister using rarely heard terms in the budget presentation. And perhaps, Professor, you can uh, shed some light on this if uh, you've, you know, probably maybe used this in your theses or whatsoever. Um, part of the words that were used, Arakian, which means then or after that. Ever heard of that, Prof? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. And the other one is, uh, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right, Marchapada, which is uh, today's world. And uh, this one, I've never heard of this, Samantalan, which is addition. And then uh, this is another one, Kandatipun, despite. Wow. Many, many beautiful words. I think it just goes to, you know, further engrave the strength of our Prime Minister's skill of being a great orator. But anyway, less of that. Let's focus on the topic at hand right now. Uh, Professor, maybe I can start off with you for you to share um, your insights. Uh, and I'll get a bit of your opinion as well on this, Jensen. Um, how would you describe Budget 2024, Prof? Okay. Well, if you look at the theme, it's about economic reform. It's about empowering people. So, basically, the government understands its constraint. It, it, you know, it totally understands that it needs to beef up the revenue. Mm -hmm. However, it also needs to take care of the welfare of the people. That's why in this budget, you could not see any significant increases in the taxes. Why? Though the government needs more revenue, especially the revenue lost by a GST and, and, and others, but it, uh, it, it doesn't want to cause hardship to the people. Though many political or economic analysts have brought this up and said the government should be braver, they say, after all, there are no general election or no state election coming. This is the opportunity. But then again, if you look positively, I think this is where the PMX as well as the cabinet ministers are showing the other side, you know, the compassion side. That means they do understand the, the, the hardship of the people, especially at the time where the cost of living is being the main agenda. And if you look at the economic reform, uh, if you look the two sectors that have been uh, uh, getting the highest allocation is health and education. And both these sectors are what we call sustainable return sectors mm. in the long term, as well as uh, agricultural sector, whereby not only the farmers are being provided with the, the subsidies, the takaful protection, the R&Ds and so on, but as well as it will also be targeted to increase our food security. So all in all, in a nutshell, I look at it, again I'll repeat, although I've said that it looks like an over-cautious budget, but then it's a responsible Responsible budget, budget is yeah, how so. you concluded it uh, last yeah. Friday. Yeah. Mm. So um, I believe that this can be the starting point of us moving forward. Mm. And... Uh, you, if, you, if, you, if you see carefully, a lot of uh, uh, emphasis has been given to the fundamental issues. 
the issues that's being paid, that being faced by the people, the hardship, the cost of living. That's why you see the cash assistance, subsidized um, rationalization or subsidy, targeted subsidy and so on. So we will speak about it you know, in depth in, in a short while, but I would say this is a responsible. That means the government is <coughs> not, taking, uh, not taking advantage of no election coming. They could have. Mm. They could have, you know, and say that, after all, they are already a government. You know, what should they be worried about introducing new tax? But then again, they are showing the, the, the passionate side, the compassion side. Mm. I think it's a responsible budget. Okay. Now, Yensen, I know uh, last Friday you uh, set the conversation, you set the scene with a lot of expectations and a lot of hows and, uh, you know, whys. Um, what do you think of the budget, Yensen? Well, I, I think uh, Budget 2024, in the spirit of the Madani economy, actually introduces key, some key measures that are indeed necessary to build a sustainable foundation to drive the future growth of Malaysia while ensuring the well-being of the people is being taken care of. And and in the absence of any measures which will increase government revenue significantly, I think the finance minister or the prime minister has actually worked within the constraints that we are facing today uh, within the Malaysian and the regional economy to target a lower budget deficit of 4.3%. Uh, last Friday, the prime minister also got the not-so-good news out of the way at the beginning of his speech, If I mean, that, and that had been the talk of the town over the last, uh, over the last, over the entire weekend, is that uh, he shared the measures uh, intended to improve the country's revenue collection, whereby um, the first one is the capital gain tax on disposal of unlisted shares by Malaysian companies at a rate of 10%, uh, beginning from 1st of March 2024, and the introduction of luxury goods tax at a rate of between 5 to 10%. Um, and also, uh, the, the biggest uh, that will affect most Malaysians would be the service tax rate from 6 to 8%. And, and I personally see this increase uh, from 6 to 8% uh, as a stopgap measure until the government is ready to uh, reintroduce a broad-based consumption tax in the form of either a GST or a VAT. And um, although this strategy to maintain the rate of service tax for food and beverages and tele telecom services is actually prudent as um, these are consumed by the masses, but some of the other sectors and services consumed by businesses will still result in an increase in the cost of doing business. And thereby, uh, what we are very worried is that we will see um, a real inflation kicking in right. from January uh, 2024 onwards. Okay. Okay, great. Now, moving on back to you, Professor. I know uh, last week and today you concluded this budget with one word saying that it's a very responsible budget, and I think it uh, goes along and it plays along uh, with the theme of the budget, which is uh, titled Reformasi Economy Memprakasa Kan Rayat, which essentially in English it means economic reform and empowering the people. Now, I know you mentioned earlier that you want to discuss and you want to describe more about it, so let's go into that. What do you think is your opinion on this theme and how do you think it applies to this quote-unquote responsible budget that you described it to be? Uh, again, like I said, it is targeted to <coughs> actually help those vulnerable and fragile group. <coughs> Number one, by increasing the cash assistance. So the Sumbangan Tunai Rahma or STR, the new uh, figure is much higher, com marginally higher compared to the previous one. Number two, no introduction of significant... Uh, Taxes. The only tax, like what the Yinsen have said just now, is the capital gain tax, as well as luxury tax, which is have nothing to do with the M40 or B40. However, I have my personal opinion that on this uh, luxury tax, I believe number one, it would be very insignificant. Number two, it might backfire. Why? These luxury tax are consumption on luxury goods by the wealthies, wealthy, T20s, T10s, and so mm. on. And what would happen is if they believe that by procuring or purchasing a luxury good in Malaysia now would be marginally more expensive because of this tax, these people are wealthy enough you know, to purchase a similar thing overseas. So what would happen is the demand for these luxury goods in Malaysia, I foresee it will decrease because these people might, might, so I say, might as well like purchase you know, these watches or these, these uh, diamond or gold mm. items in overseas at a much cheaper, uh, cheaper price. And I have this uh, uh, 
a luxury to to travel and so on. So it might backfire those in the industry or the supply of mm. this luxury good. That might be backfire. Okay. So the second is what, what I believe is uh, the uh, number one, the cash incentive. Number two, like I said, the targeted assistance that is being given to farmers, fishermen, as well as uh, rubber tappers. Okay, these are the people who are in the B10, ten eh, percent low. But these are the important people who are involved with our food security. So by assisting these people, we indirectly also assisting the whole nation on the food security. So this is what empowering the people. Mm. When you say empowering the people, you are empowering on one side by increasing their income, mm. reducing their, mitigating their their expenditure. Mm. But the bigger picture is. You are empowering the nation, the other rakyats in terms of food security, uh, control prices, and so on. Mm. So, but having said that, like I said, the government also have its constraints. If we cannot be giving and giving and giving, right? So this is where, if you if you look in the details. However, I would like to see more details on the SST increase. Although on surface it is said that it will increase from six percent to eight percent, and there are exemption given to food and beverage and telecommunication, but we need to see the details. Hmm. Okay, we need to see see the details so that we can we can discuss more freely on the impact on the B40 and M40. Currently, it's still vague because it's just say you know two percent increase and there are exemption. Even in food and beverage itself, there would be some micro details. What would be exempted and what would be not, and so on. But I agree with him. Saying, I, I believe this is a so-called stopgap. The government does not wants to reintroduce the GST at this moment. Mm. But we do agree the government needs badly this consumption-based tax, mm. right? So this can be a buying time for them. You know, for them to structure well, whether we want to reintroduce GST. Or we can, we call it VAT, whatever it is, but it will be a consumption-based tax mm. because generally it has shown that the consumption-based tax is much more effective and efficient compared to income-based tax because in income-based tax people are very creative, very innovative. You know, they 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 can come up with documentation mm. just to reduce the income tax, but consumption is quite difficult for them mm. to do that. So this can be another year for the government to think about it, to do proper planning, proper structure, structuring of a consumption-based tax in the future. Mm. The joke over the weekend about consumption-based tax is that maybe people who love to head over to karaoke centers will now start to have to think of doing karaoke back at home or in the bathroom, maybe, <laughs> <laughs> instead of heading over to the karaoke centers. Anyway, uh, moving on to, to our next question, um, you know, Budget 2024 uh, involved uh, an allocation of 393.8 billion ringgit, and uh, 303.8 billion ringgit from that was allocated for OPEX, uh, operational expenditure, and then the remaining 90 billion for uh, DevEx, development expenditure, and then uh, 2 billion from that is uh, going towards contingency savings. Now, Jensen, what do you think about what was presented during the tabling of the budget? Well, I, I think the um, gross development expenditure allocation for 2024 is at 90 billion, and these actually constitute to only four and a half percent of gross development product of our GDP, which is above the three percent minimum threshold under the recently passed uh, public finance and fiscal responsi- responsibility bill 2023 by the Parliament. Um, it's very hard to say whether it's fair or not fair enough or not enough but i but what my fundamental belief is that the government needs to do more to enlarge the economic pie um agree with what prof said earlier the government doesn't have much choice in terms of raising more revenue therefore we see capital gain tax on unlisted shares we see luxury good tax we see increase of sst or the service tax but but i also would like to also touch a bit on the potential backlash uh, you know, following what uh, Professor have shared earlier, is that uh, look at all the big malls in Malaysia. Yeah, um, most of the big malls somewhat rely on uh, anchor tenants, uh, mm. and most of the time they are the bigger brands, the luxury goods. And assuming that uh, the influx of tourists 
post-COVID is not exactly very impressive for many countries in ASEAN, not only just Malaysia, uh, because of um, regional geopolitical sentiments or um, whatever sentiment uh, from their own home country and therefore affecting the influx of uh, foreign uh, tourists to Malaysia. Um, whether we like to admit it or not, the luxury goods market very much heavily relying on local consumption. Mm. And I agree, completely agree with what uh, Professor have shared earlier is that assuming that uh, a, a slap of eight, uh, 5 to even 10% of luxury goods tax on all these goods will impact the sales um, of such brands in Malaysia. And eventually, uh, you know, sooner or later, if the foreign tourist market doesn't come back or, or, or it's not as forthcoming as we hope and wish for, they may actually um, either downsize their um, outfit in Malaysia or they may actually leave Malaysia. Let me give you some example. During COVID, many brands have actually left Malaysia. I mean the fashion brands. They are not considered um, a luxury goods brand, but they are just um, high street fashion brands. Many have actually closed down their physical stores in Malaysia for very obvious reasons. Market is smaller. Uh, consumption power is not exactly there. And instead, they have moved their outlets to Bangkok and to Singapore, and even to Vietnam and Cambodia. Mm. And, um, and, and of course, Indonesia has, you know, have gained a lot from this. So uh, I also do not want to see um, a small move towards um, taxing on certain sector will have larger and more complicated um, trickling down effects and impact on other sectors. Mm. Um, and and, and that's, that's my worry as well. Okay. Number two, number two that I would like to talk about, uh, coming back to this service tax a little, is that um, perhaps yeah, we may even see a fall in um, KLSC transactions because um, this higher tax also covers the transaction tax, transaction uh, service tax uh, in the um, what do you call it, in the share market, and as we all know that Malaysia is not exactly the most uh, liquid market to, to play. I, yeah, I use mm. the word play. Yeah? Um, and, and when we introduce such a tax, then the uh, brokerage fee to trade in Malaysia, the transaction cost will become higher. Then it may also impact trading activities on Bursa. Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. All right. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for that. Now, very quickly, before we give way for the 12 o'clock news, just touching on the same question, uh, you know, uh, Prof, earlier you and I discussed about uh, mega projects at the moment right now. The focus is uh, up north in Penang with the MRT. Now, I just want to talk about this $2 billion contingency savings. Very quickly, um, you know, what do you think would these contingency savings be used for? And, you know, historically, how has it been allocated? Has it gone on the rise or has it been declined or hit a plateau? What do you think? Okay, the, you know, in this context, it's, it's quite crucial to link this up to something that happened pre-budget. What uh, Yin Sen have mentioned, the RUU that was approved. In the RUU that was approved, the ceiling uh, for the debt was, uh, was uh, stated as such. Mm. If you remember, like what Prof. Jomo also have mentioned uh, last week, the current Prime Minister was the Finance Minister during the crisis previously. And at that point of time, we have to exceed that ceiling. Mm. But now, he, if I can use the word, they have been handcuffed. Mm. You know, th there are no more freedom for you to, to, to do that. So it's quite a worry with the contingency uh, only allocated $2 billion. $2 billion. What would happen if we face another crisis like the financial crisis mm. or the pandemic and then the finance minister or the prime minister could not, it does not have the freedom. So that's another risk that we are going to face. Okay, we shall hold that thought and continue with the discussion in less than six minutes from now. As usual, we'll be crossing over to the RTM News Centre for the 12 o'clock news updates and then right after that, budget 2024 analysis with our guests will continue. Stay tuned. Welcome back to another brand new hour of Tracks Momentum with me, Anil, on the mic. And our dialogue now resumes as we discuss uh, about budget 2024. It's an in-depth analysis and I have two special guests, uh, 
joining me. One is in the studios, one is in the phone lines. In the studios right now, I have economic analysts at the International Center for Education and Islamic Finance, Professor Dr. Barum bin Abdul Hamid. And on the phone line, I have founder and CEO uh, for the Center for Research, Advisory and Technology. In short, it's called CREATE, Ang Yen Sen. Yen Sen, Professor, welcome back to the dialogue. Hi. Hi. Thank you for having us, Anya. You're welcome. Uh, now, Jensen, I'm going to start off with you, um, mm-hmm. but uh, I need a favor from you. I want you to make, um, I want you to elaborate on this answer so that it's very relatable and it, it can resonate well to the rakyat and, you know, make it, uh, you know, relatable to the layman. And because this involves a very huge amount, it's 51, 58.1 billion, which has been allocated by the government to fund various initiatives. And this includes, you know, uh, subsidies, incentives, and also some assistance. And we also know that almost 50% of the allocation is actually for controlling prices of goods and services. Now, from your perspective, speaking out to the Rakyat tuning into our show right now, do you think this will positively impact the well-being of the people in our country? You see, um, according to Putrajaya yesterday, Mm. uh, a budget monitoring committee will be established to ensure that allocations under the budget are well dispersed. Mm. Okay, that is one. And then uh, the minister, I mean, uh, the minister also said that uh, this community, uh, this committee will be headed by Prime Minister Anwar Ibrahim and Deputy Prime Minister and the Treasury uh, uh, KSU himself um, and will be in line with this public finance fiscal responsibility bill and all that. But Yes, I understand that government um, has the intention to set up committees and monitoring entities to ensure that um, budget is being dispersed to the right communi- uh, community and the people. But um, let me also um, put the horse uh, in front of the cart okay, to, to mm-hmm. say this. Um, Malaysia, we are very good at coming up with policies and plans. Somehow, we are always lacking in implementation. And I think nobody can fault me for making this statement. We have been like this over over the last, I don't know, since civilization. Whoever becomes government. And as taxpayers, I hope that this government can really walk the talk, can really implement what they say they want to implement. Because any leakages of budget, any misuse or misappropriate of funds, uh, they are all coming from you and I, the taxpayers. Mm. Okay, and I personally do not agree that the government allocate too much money to do enforcement. Yes, it's important to have budget for enforcement, but if we spend too much money on enforcement, then we may lose the entire big picture of how to help the people instead of, you know, uh, so so money should be spent on lowering prices, uh, controlling, but if we spend too much money on enforcement alone, then we may lose the entire fundamentals of why we are doing this. Okay. I think, yeah. Okay, all right. Thanks for your thoughts there, uh, Jensen. Now, moving on to uh, Professor. Uh, Professor, now, since you actually come from the education sector, I think this uh, question is just very fitting for you. The government agrees to, you know, make the skills improvement program under the My Future Jobs platform very accessible uh, to all My Step appointments. And this initiative uh, apparently is set to offer 50,000 job opportunities on a contract basis in the public sector and also the GLCs um, for starting January next year. Who do you think can actually benefit from this initiative, uh, Professor? Okay, Anil, first of all, this is a very positive action. It will definitely, I think, benefit the most uh, the graduate unemployed. Hmm. You see, the, these graduate unemployed, they have this, uh, what do you call, a temporary unemployment, hmm. uh, waiting for suitable jobs and others. So this can fill up the gap. That's number one. Number two, this could also act for them as a place where they could uh, get gain some knowledge, some experience. On top of that, it can also provide some uh, good brains to the GLCs as well as the public sector, hmm. because we are we are also afraid of brain drain. You know, when uh, uh, graduates they are unemployed for a certain period of time, they'll be looking at opportunities overseas, across the border, and so on. And uh, I, I honestly believe that, again, like what Ian Sen has said, you know, we have been talking like a broken record here, but we want it to be transparent. Where are these jobs being created? How many of them have been filled up? By whom? And what is the income that has been paid? And so on. 
you see, measuring and reporting are important components, as important as having a good blueprint. You see, a blueprint is just only the first step, but the implementation, the execution, the measurement, and so on. And again, like I said, this is very surface. When you say 50,000 job opportunities, it's very surface. We have to be uh, more uh, in detail. What kind of jobs are being uh, being offered here? What kind of opportunity is being offered? And what can they learn? This could also discourage some of the graduates to jump on the bandwagon of gig economy. Mm. Uh, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that gig economy is not good. But I say gig economy can be a temporary stopgap measure. But if these graduates, they take gig, um, uh, gig e employment as a permanent employment, number one, they would lose their skills over time because, mm -hmm. you know, just to get an extra income because the gig economy offers them an opportunity to earn as much as you could. But in certain crucial uh, graduates' discipline like engineering, uh, you know, even medicine, bio, and so on, you need to update yourself with the latest uh, development. Mm. So that's number one. And by the time they realize after three or four years that they are actually left out of the latest development, this is where it, it, it impacts them the most. Number two, the government would lose as well because there would be a lot of graduate employees in certain uh, technology or tech-based or engineering-based sector that we would, might have a shortage in the future when people start joining the gig economy just for the sake of the extra income, the un unlimited, so-called unlimited income and so on. But again, like I said, this my step is a positive step, it's mm. a baby step, but we need more details on that, what kind of employment and what could benefit them and how, how much they could earn and what is the uh, future. Uh, especially, we are talking about progressive uh, wage in the future, we are, to, uh, we are talking about you know providing uh, value-added or or uh, uh, employment in a high value sector and so on so we need a we need a proper mechanism of measuring reporting and so the stakeholders would be more satisfied mm. now still still uh, focusing my attention on to you professor uh you know you concluded the budget as being a very responsible budget because you felt that uh, there are lots of you know focus being given to the smallholders to the farmers who are actually out there you know plowing their land uh and on that note the second blanjawan madani actually provides a 2.6 billion uh, allocation which include various subsidies and also incentives to farmers as well as fishermen and uh, we know that this is actually part of the government's efforts to, you know, ensure, as you said, sustainability of the country's agro-food industry. But my question to you is, Prof, do you think this will actually help stabilize the supply and demand trend that's in our country? Uh, it would. It would. It would uh, in terms of it would uh, ensure a continuous supply. Mm. You see, when the prices of a certain goods go below a certain point, you know, then they might close shop, they might cease to operate, and this will cause more stress on the supply of certain goods and services. For example, we have seen that in, in, in the supply of chicken, egg in, in the past. So yes, these are the, the important segments uh, where we can achieve many different objectives and goals. Number one, we could help those who are vulnerable, B40s, earning less, Number two, much bigger picture is we could ensure a sustainable supply of food, especially food. Eh? When we talk about food security. Uh, but again, like I said, uh, it is more than that. We should be allocating this together with the others. Uh, Anil, eh? mm. On one side, this is to ensure the current situation. Mm. But at the same time, remember, there's also money being allocated for research and development with the matching grant and others. So this is, again, like I have mentioned on Friday, I would like to see the academia, the institution, mm. being involved in more impactful study. Okay. That means use this money, the grant that been allocated for research and development wisely do some research that can make a change to the life of the man on the street. Mm. Uh, what can uh, make their life better, the quality of life of the rakyat better. So try to indulge more in applied, impactful research that can give return to the people as well as to the nation. I'm not saying that, you know, uh, uh, I'm not saying that theoretical, uh, liter uh, theoretical research is not important, but I say 
currently we are facing a problem. Okay. To solve for the current problem. Okay. Solve the current problem. Yen Sen, moving on to you, you spoke mm-hmm. on uh, tax rates in the country. And, um, mm-hmm. you know, you, you made a few comparisons uh, about a uh, few things where, you know, we are lacking a little bit perhaps, or maybe we are ahead from our neighbors, um, which also includes tax rates. Um, now, increasing the tax rate, uh, the sales tax to 8% from 6%, do you think this will be burdensome for the M40 group? Mm, it's definitely going to be burdensome mm. because um, I think I mentioned on Friday that when this 2% increase covers logistics, um, we will see um, inflate, inflated price. I wouldn't, well, inflated prices is not the exactly the best word to use, but we will see price increase across the board. Um, and this is something unavoidable. Mm. So once prices increase, it's going to affect the B10, even T10, everybody's going to be affected. Mm. And um, with the um, with the what it, the removal of the ceiling price of egg and chicken, mm. which of course is for the greater good, um, we will also see increase in food prices because chicken and eggs are staple in Malaysia. Okay, well, Jensen, just to pick on your brain a little bit, I want you to you know just provide your expertise. Is inflation is a word that has been excessively been used in our country over the last twenty thirty years. Every time we're faced with an economic crisis, we talk about inflation, deflation, lots of shins. <laughs> but uh, we, are, I, I'm, I'm sure that the the younger generation out there who are actually tuning into the show may not really understand how will this impact them. So very quickly, Yensen, could you just give us an understanding? What is inflation really? What is deflation and anything else that encompasses that? Really quickly, Yensen, please. Okay, uh, maybe maybe I go uh, back to very basic, to layman mm. terms that everybody can understand. Sure. For, for, a, young pe- for a young person or anybody em- uh, employed, uh, most of the time, I'm not saying all the time, mm. that you may see a small clause in your employment contract that says, your your annual your your salary will be reviewed every year and most of the time it's going to be a three percent increase to be in tandem with the inflationary increase in the uh, in the economy uh, so that would mean that your salary will be adjusted up by three percent every year so that it can cover inflation okay mm. that's how people understand inflation mm. um, and every year and every now and then the government or different countries will say oh inflation is at three percent four percent three percent is healthy two point eight is good um, as long as we don't touch five and six and ten that you know people will not go bankrupt and things like that so people would most of the time people are very scared when they hear the word inflation because mm. that would mean that driving uh, prices up However, um, it is also unhealthy for a for a country to, to go through deflation. Okay, mm. if a country go through deflation, it is seriously bad news as well. We want inflation, but not crazily inflated. Okay, so very quickly, uh, where very, are we? Where are we right now? I think I think we are at three point something percent. Prof, mm. Am I correct? Yeah, for, yeah, you're correct. Twenty twenty four. Yes, yes. About three point something percent, percent. But I always say this again, and year in year out, I make the same statement. Mm. Government can declare X percent of inflation for this year and expect it to be next year. But me as Malaysian, I always look at my basket of goods. If mm. today I spend one hundred and fifty ringgit in the supermarket to buy groceries every ten days. Do I still spend the same 150 ringgit to get the same amount of goods mm. next year uh, every 10 days? Okay. That is the real inflation to me. Let's wait and see when you go grocery shopping the next time you send all your thoughts. Yes. Let's go in That's for a quick break. Inflation. Let's go in for a quick break. When we come back, we shall resume with the discussion. Keep it right here on Tracks Momentum. We're discussing about the budget 2024 and we are analyzing it. Stay tuned. Welcome back. Uh, this is Budget 2024 Analysis, and I'm speaking to Professor Dr. Baron Ben Abdul Hamid, as well as Ng Yen Sen, and we're analyzing the budget that was tabled last Friday by our Prime Minister. And uh, yes, let's start off this, uh, this part of the discussion with you, Professor. Uh, this year, the government has mobilized a special team under the Ministry of Local Government Development uh, to address issues related to delayed, sick, and also abandoned private housing projects. You spoke uh, about that last Friday. And uh, that has actually burdened home buyers. And as of August 2023, 256 uh, sick projects involving 28,000 housing units have been restored uh, with a gross development value of $23.37 billion. 
And uh, overall, $2.47 billion is allocated to implement housing projects uh, for the people next year. Uh, do you think this will positively impact the quality of life for the Rakyat? Uh, Anil, uh, actually people are sick of hearing about sick projects. <laughs> the impact is huge. You, you imagine some, some, someone, Rakyat, buys a house and he can't move in, the project is not completed, he has to service the loan as well as pay for his rental currently. So the impact is huge. And, uh, I, and I could see that the seriousness of this current government into trying to find a solution to this. And if you if you have said the figures just now, there are many projects that have been restored. Mm. And this would have economic impact of those people who are paying double. The installment for the unfinished home that they have bought, the rent for the current, so that would inc or definitely uh, allow them to have a higher disposable income. And this higher disposable income will be injected back to the economy, and that's a, what we call a multiplier effect. But much beyond that, we also want to know what are the steps that have been taken to stop projects becoming sick. You know, right. so it, it, there there was a there was a period when it was just a norm. Every now and then we hear uh, uncompleted projects, abandoned projects, and so on. Why does this has to go on and on when we already have some mechanism? This should not have happened in the first place. Okay, now even if you see the SPNB is also going after the previous management of some some uh, malpractice that have been done. So I see this as a positive. Mm -hmm. It has a positive economic impact not only for the buyers of the abandoned or the sick sick projects, but also the economy as overall. Like I said, you know, from the savings that they could have get, gotten from these restored projects, that money would be pumped back into the economy. So mm -hmm. there will be a multiplier effect. Okay. Now, Jensen, moving on to you, uh, let's talk about the Rahma initiatives, which is very synonymous to the current Madani government and administration we are under. Uh, the government will actually allocate $200 million to continue the Payong Rahma initiatives. And uh, this allocation, uh, you know, apparently will be raised to $10 billion from the $8 billion uh, this year. Uh, how do you think these initiatives can actually help ease the burden of our people? I think such one-off uh, payment can help people uh, for a while, but it's definitely not a sustainable and long-term solution. Mm. Um, well, every government tend to give cash uh, transfers, and if this is the only way to be more efficient in targeted subsidies, mm. uh, then we welcome this, this move. Uh, but again, we, we, we really hope that the people who receive such cash uh, will put the cash into great use. Uh, because uh, financial literacy is also something that we have not addressed uh, in this budget, but it, mm. uh, we, we always see the word financial literacy and all that uh, in the previous budget, but not, not anymore this time around. Uh, so I'm, I'm just uh, assuming uh, that the people will manage their finances well. And, and, and seriously, although this uh, targeted cash transfers is by far uh, perhaps the, the better alternative than mm. blanket subsidy, uh, but but again, um, as long as the people look to the government for cash handouts, it is not the best solution mm. uh, in the long run. Yeah. So that said, Jensen, what do you think uh, about the targeted approach? Uh, you know, to, about this subsidies for the people. You know, do and and you know, what's your opinion on you that the best approach that you think should be done to ensure that you know the people actually can reap the most maximum benefit from these. I, I think manage, I think uh, financial management is very important uh, for mm. for the people. But in terms of how accurate is the targeted approach, uh, very much go back to how efficient the government database can be, mm. and how do they actually build the database, and where does the raw data come from? I, I think any statistician or people in the research um, field will actually go back to raw data. How do you actually get the raw data? How updated is it? It is. Uh, how sure are you that it's not being manipulated? It's not um, engineered. You know things like that. Because in in many countries, whether it's coupon based, it's food vouchers, it's cash vouchers, or whatever, there is bound to be leakages. And mm. I mean, I, I don't think leakages can be completely eliminated, two hundred percent. But as long as we can keep that to the bare minimum, uh, then uh, I, I think that's a good start. Mm. Now, uh, Professor, over to you. Um, uh, your expertise as an analyst, of course, we know and we see that there are lots of announcements that have been made about, you know, the various allocations that have been set aside for the budget. But in a nutshell, where do you think the focus is actually on 
in Budget 2024? Where do you think that the government actually is putting more attention on to drive? Which sector or whatever it is, what do you think? For me, I look at the budget, the main, main, uh, main focus of the government is looking at the cost of living. See, you see, that's the, in, a, in a nutshell. Because if you look, the subsidies that are given is to mitigate the rise in the price. The cash assistance that are given are uh, intended to reduce uh, the sufferings of the people. Uh, the revival of those uh, sick projects, again, would, are helping. So, like, again, like I said, in the earlier part, it's a responsible budget mm. which is targeting at reducing the people's hardship. Uh, that's why I call it responsible because though the government needs money, mm. needs more revenue, but it has taken a, sec a back seat, mm. the government is focusing on empowering the people first. And then it believes that once the people are empowered, mm. then automatically the nation would be empowered. Again, like I said, it's not only the subsidy, it's not only the cost of price, it's not only cost of living and so on. It is also about ensuring a good health uh, segment sector mm. support again which is also tailored for the sustainable growth of the people okay education as well mm. now prof let's let's put things into a very positive perspective um, of course you know every year the budget comes around the rocky they hear allocations being made to you know so on and so forth many different sectors many many issues that are facing the people now in your opinion for the benefit of our listeners when such an uh, announcement is being made how soon can the people start seeing these changes that will you say that you say will impact and you know uh, improve the quality of their lives? How soon can they see it? Okay, hmm. <clears throat> first of all, this budget will only kick off in first January, hmm. but you could see the waves in terms of number one foreign direct investment, number two in terms of strategizing should be starting yesterday. Okay, again, like I said. Here, I would like to see a new culture. On one side, the government is driving the nation, is driving the economy. As a rakyat, what can we do? Yes. As an uh, entrepreneur, what can we do? What, uh, like a supporting industry, what we can do? At the same time, I would like to also see the financial sector coming forward with how are they going to support. You know, for example, the banks coming forward and say that we understand the government's concern, constraint and everything. We are going to support by offering these kind of services and so on. You know, even Bank Negara would also needs to come up with its own statement. You know, we have already listened to the budget, which is the fiscal part of it. On the monetary policy, we are going to have a complementary uh, supporting policy. Mm. So again, like I said, I would like to see a concerted effort. This is not the job of the government alone. But this is a job for all of us. We need to help to build the nation together. Okay. All right. Thank you very much for sharing those insights because I think that's very necessary for the people out there to know what is it in for them. Let's take a quick break. And when I come back, we will continue and wrap up our dialogue session. Keep it right here. Right here. Right here. Right, right, right. right here. On Tracks FM. And welcome back to Budget 2024 Analysis. Joining me is Ng Yen Sen and also Professor Dr. Baron Ben Abdul Hamid. And we are analyzing the budget that was tabled last Friday by our Prime Minister. Now, coming back uh, into the discussion, we've discussed a lot about whatever that's being focused here in the peninsula. Now, let's move our attention over the you know beautiful, enchanting waters of the South China Sea to Sabah and Sarawak. Uh, you know, uh, our friends there will get a, an increased allocation uh, with Sabah getting 6.6 .6 billion compared to 6.5 previously. And Sarawak will uh, be getting 5.8 billion compared to 5.6 billion. So that's like about a billion and two, two billion, a point, point, point one billion and point two billion increase compared to what they were allocated previously. Professor, very quickly, what's your take on this? My take on it, again, like I said, this is a multi-pronged strategy. Number one, we have to admit that Sabah and Sarawak should be, uh, like what they have been fighting for, be taken as equal as peninsula and not as the same as the states in peninsula. Number two, we know that they are lagging behind peninsula, so that it would not 
vouch nicely for the country in the future. So what we want, we want to bring them together. And the third one is the PMX have shown that he wants political stability. Hmm. And this is Kerajaan Perpaduan. It's unity not a single, government. Yeah. Unity government. Hmm. So in order for, for, for him to have a unity support from all sides to show a stable political uh, stability to the foreign investors, this is something that needs to be done. Hmm. So I believe that this would have a lasting impression on the foreign uh, investors. That means, you know, finally, after quite some time, we are having a stable government and we are thinking about spreading the wealth of the nation across so that, you know, we, it would not be forever saying that the East Malaysia is lagging behind West Malaysia because we only have one Malaysia. Hmm. Okay. Yensen, your thoughts on the increase of budget allocation for Saban Sarawak? I think I think this is a fair move, uh, and it's a good effort to you know um, close the development gap between uh, East and West Malaysia. Um, in fact, if you look at the land size, and if you refer back to MA sixty three, Sabah Sarawak should actually constitute. Uh, you know, first is they should uh, Sabah Sarawak should constitute to one third of parliamentary um, seats in the uh, in the parliament. Uh, and by right, Sabah Sarawak um, should have been given more budget over the years because we, we have to remember that Sabah Sarawak, is, uh, they, the, both the two states are actually a um, large contributor of, uh, national co- to the national coffer because of their exports in oil and gas and the very blessed uh, natural resources in the two states. So I think um, development gap can be closed. Uh, number two is um, I also would like to applaud the federal government for trans- for transferring the regulatory power to Sabah uh, state government and even Sarawak uh, for for Sabah and Sarawak by appointing um, the uh, the what do you call that the director the, the committee uh, to the Indian Revenue Board so that uh, Sabah and Sarawak also have their state say in the um, IRB. The third one that I would like to mention is that the move that the federal government government have also transferred regulatory power to Sabah state government um, to to what do you call that uh, to provide continuous support to the state government in strengthening the electricity industry in Sabah um, is a very good move because we all know that Sabah has an energy issue. Sabah has elect electricity issue because of the grid, because of the geographical um, makeup of the place. And I think uh, this move, although it's um, delayed over the years, but it's definitely um, applaudable. Okay. Now, moving, yeah. uh, moving, moving slightly away from analysis, let's move on to personal opinions. Uh, you know, we touched on all the various allocations that have been set aside by the government for the people, for the development of the country. Um, now, I want to get your opinion. Now, I know, Yensen, you will have... A lot of candid thoughts, and you're pretty radical. But so I'm going to come to you in a bit. But I'll focus on Professor for a bit. So, Professor, in your opinion, um, will Budget 2024 address the true needs of the people of the Rakyat? Partially, I would say partially. Uh, in fact, I say majority of it. Uh, and remember, we have constraints. Like I said, we have constraints. You know, we have to be realistic. We have to think about the next generation as well. This government could have taken a populist stand. That means just simply spending, just simply allocating. But the one who that would suffer is the next generation. So that's why you know I keep saying that it's a responsible budget. You know, realizing a very practical, feasible budget. I would like to see this as the turning point, mm. uh, the starting point. You know, we have gone through quite a difficult period, pandemic, political instability, and so on. I would like to see we are turning the corner and, you know, moving to be a better nation in the future. Like I said, we have to be realistic and we have to we have to understand mm. and we have to support. When I say support, this is where, like I said, uh, just about a couple of minutes ago, I said, let us support the budget together. Let us build the nation together. It's not only the job of the government, mm. but it's the job of we as rakyat, is the job of the private sector, is the job of the financial sector. So I would like to see them coming forward mm. and declaring, you "No, know, we are going to support this budget. This is the initiative that we are going to undertake to help the gov- uh, Malaysia accelerate towards becoming a sustainable growth country. Yen Shen? Mm, I think 
think a significant portion of the budget is now being set aside for education will actually lay the foundation for Malaysia's sustainable and inclusive growth, especially in terms of training and upskilling people. And the allocation of 100 million in grants to support the MSMEs in digitalization is also a very important move, uh, you know, to ensure that Malaysia SMEs and SMIs to to improve in terms uh, to improve the productivity through digitalization and automation because this will ultimately bolster our nation's competitiveness and facilitate growth towards a high income nation. At a personal level, I would like to urge everybody to not hope that um, any any annual budget every year will be the magic wand to solve all your problems. Mm. Uh, national budget is just a responsibility is a responsibility and a homework a piece of assignment um, mm. for the government to deliver to the people to, to tell the people how you're how you are making the money and how you're spending the money eventually it is still up to the people to you know uh, to to fend for yourself you need to continue to work hard you need to mm. continue to build your own economic pie to put forth on the table for your for your family okay all right. Thank you very much for your thoughts. And uh, there you have it to our dear listeners. Uh, we just uh, concluded Budget 2024 analysis with two of our guest speakers. Uh, we had Professor Dr. Baron bin Abdul Hamid, the economic analyst at International Center for Education and Islamic Finance, and also Ng Yen Sen, the founder and CEO for Center for Research, Advisory and Technology. And today we dive deep into the heart of the fiscal matters with a special focus on uh, the t- budget that was tabled last uh, week, last Friday by our Prime Minister. Uh, if you missed out on this uh, dialogue, don't worry, you can head straight on to our Facebook page at Tracks FM Official and replay the entire dialogue session there that I had with my two lovely guests. That's all the time we have for you for this time's dialogue. Until we meet again next time, keep it right here. Anil on the mic will be back to conclude and bring you through 2 p.m. for Tracks Momentum. Stay tuned.